Welcome to the Collaborative Podcast. I'm your host, Spencer Krauss. Our guest today is Amanda Scroy. Amanda is the Director of Autonomy and Computer Vision at RE Square Robotics. Amanda, welcome to the pod. Hi, thanks for having me. Pleasure to have you on. It's been a while we've been wanting to do this. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, very excited to get to know you, uh, get to know more about your work. Um, and yeah, just kind of dig right in. So you mentioned off camera, you had kind of uh, like a non-traditional background a little bit. Um, do you want to talk about what that looks like and kind of how you got to where you are today? Yeah. So I did my undergrad at Duquesne University. So in Pittsburgh, I got my bachelor's in mathematics and computer science. Um, and I actually did a lot of undergrad research with Dr. Stacey Levine in image processing. So I started like very heavy mathematics type of image work. I uh, decided I wanted to go to grad school really early on in my undergrad career, ended up at Notre Dame, and I did a lot of biometrics focused computer vision at Notre Dame. Awesome. So I was doing iris recognition and face recognition, and my thesis was about how you can spoof the imposter side of a biometrics algorithm by making somebody else look like another person with very, very small perturbations. Um, and that kind of led me into an initial job in industry that was more focused in biometrics and chemical engineering type of image processing, but I very quickly got excited by ground navigation uh, and ground autonomy. Everyone, you know, self-driving cars, uh, all of that industry is booming in Pittsburgh and all around the world. Oh, for sure. Yeah. So I was at, um, NEA systems for a while where I was a computer, uh, computer vision engineer. And eventually I met Jürgen Pedersen and, you know, there is an opportunity to work with robotic manipulators and move them from the teleoperated world to the semi-autonomous and autonomous world. And I took that opportunity and that's where I landed today. Sweet. Would you have been with uh, Mike at NIA or NIA? Yeah, say? Mike and I worked together at NIA for about a year before I transitioned. Cool. Yeah. I like that guy a lot. So that's awesome. <laughs> as I like Jürgen as well. Yeah. Oh, yeah, um, so Parag, yeah, I originally worked with Parag, uh, and then Parag kind of stepped out of the president role, uh, and Mike stepped in like right around the same time I was leaving. Yeah, and he's just recently stepped out. I feel like a couple of weeks ago. <laughs> yeah, he he like texted me the announcement and let me know ahead of time. Yeah, me uh, too. We both stay in touch. Mike's a great guy. Yeah, and no, I, I like him a lot. Uh, we were both co-consultants at Innovation Works a while ago, where he's working now. And uh, yeah, oh. yeah. Yeah, and, um, uh, we used to try to when I worked at NAIA, we would go to Alpha Lab uh, kind of frequently and talk to some people about potential collaborations. I really like that vibe, right? Uh, in Pittsburgh, where everybody wants to be collaborative, uh, so that was something cool that he always fostered within me as well. That's awesome. Yeah, yeah, solid dude for sure. I kind of want to ask about your uh, your thesis work, if that's okay. Yeah, just because I know nothing about biometrics and I'm curious, <laughs> and I, I want to know how that works. How do you detect an iris? How do you recognize, well, not detect, but how, like, what are the, the things you're looking for? Yeah, so um, in general, the iris biometric side of things, there is a pretty well-known algorithm for what's called unrolling the iris. So you take a picture of the iris um, in the infrared spectrum okay. and you find the pupil boundary and the boundary of the colored part and the white part of your eye and then you get kind of this ring. And then there's what's called the John Dogman algorithm, which allows you to unroll the iris and then encode it uh, in different bits. And then you compare those bits across different irises. Um, yeah, so you're looking for, like everybody has a unique pattern in the eye. And we did a lot of really interesting work with twins. So seeing how similar twins irises oh, were. Cool. Uh, as well as family members. And then we also had some really special cases because we did a lot of data collection at the university. Uh, for example, we found one person that had a false eye and it was really screwing up our data set. And we actually reached back to that person and, and asked them what was going on. Um, <laughs> yeah, so it was pretty cool. With twins, can you spoof an identical twin's uh, eye print? Like if you're trying to... um, I don't I don't think you can necessarily spoof them. They are pretty unique, but they are more similar than other irises of other people. That's interesting. So if you've got the same exact genetics, and uh, again, forgive me if this is really tangential <laughs> and not what you're working on now. We could obviously change the subject, but I'm just really, really intrigued. Um, 
You, even though you've got the same exact genetics, your eye develops differently because of life Yeah, experience. it's just like just... fingerprints, right? The fingerprints of identical twins are different. I didn't know that either. All right. Yeah. <laughs> so we used <laughs> to go to this event uh, in Twinsburg, Ohio, which is an, a yearly event of twins and multiples. That's awesome. And we would do data collection. So they would come to our tent. We would scan their face, get a 2D face image, a 3D face image, get their iris image, get their fingerprints, and use this all for you know, uh, our analysis and we would give them like a Walmart gift card. Right. And it was nice. all for their festivities. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's awesome. That's Twinsburg is hilarious for that. So <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, um, I guess what kind of things are you working on now? Uh, that obviously that you're allowed to talk about. Yeah. Um, so one of the coolest things that we're working on right now, uh, in my opinion is, uh, solar field installation with our oh, you're going to tell me about that. That is a really neat project. Yeah. So we're working with uh, some different industry partners, and this is the Department of Energy project where we're building a robotic system to essentially pick and place solar panels from a delivery vehicle onto the racking system. So there's a lot of perception here that's outdoors and, you know, dirty and dangerous environments where you're detecting the solar panels. You're moving the manipulator on a larger system to pick it up and then placing it on a rack without damaging the panel at all. Uh, and then this is a little bit collaborative <laughs> where <laughs> there's an, a human, you know, in the loop that's doing the, the clamping and torquing, you know, the final little stages nice. of getting that panel on. So it reduces the workforce, but it's also really helping the workforce because this is a really labor intensive job of picking up these, you know, fairly heavy modules and putting them on a rack over and over again. The racks are five feet high off the ground, um, and it normally takes a crew of five people. And we're trying to reduce the crew down to one or two. Oh, cool. Yeah, that's awesome. And I mean, I feel like, you know, so many people, at least people that haven't tried to do this are quick to say, well, we just should make it the robot that does everything. You're like, whoa, buddy, <laughs> slow down. <laughs> that's going to be incredibly expensive and maybe not the most feasible thing in the world. Maybe we scope it in. So yeah. Uh, and then you get into the robot on a robot solution, right? <laughs> robot on a robot? Yeah. So uh, there there are some other solutions, you know, for similar problems where you have a robot moving the, you know, moving something and then another robot attached to that robot. That's oh. Doing a task. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I heard the term AAMR, uh, I think, recently. Or... AMMR, like Autonomous Mobile Manipulator Robot. It's just people just seem to like inventing more of these acronyms, you know? <laughs> it's like, no, it's a robot on top of another robot. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you, need, you don't need an acronym. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, no, that's awesome. So what are, what are some of the, I guess, like the challenges that you've had to surmount working on that project that have been kind of interesting for you? Yeah. So, um, you know, a lot of the perception capabilities that we're trying to spin up at RE squared are in outdoor environments. Um, you know, you have different lighting conditions, different weather conditions. Right now we're handling up to moderate rain. Uh, you need to make sure that you're picking the sensors that can handle the temperature readings that your system is going to be under. Um, particularly in the, the solar uh, field problem, you know, there's we're to, a lot of times you're building these out in desert spaces, so you'll have a lot of sand. Oh, cool. Right? Uh, and it's a lot of high sun, so you get sun glare. So working with you know some of the pre-processing in order to make sure that we're detecting the modules every single time the same way with the same accuracy. So really handling all of those edge cases of weather conditions and lighting conditions is one of the main challenges we're faced with. Forgive me if you can't answer this, but are you allowed to mark the modules at all in order to make that task easier? We are not marking the modules. Nice. <laughs> uh, and in fact, we're developing the algorithm in such a way that it can extend not only from like the specific module this project is focused on, but to other modules across the industry. That's really, really cool. And I mean, as I'm not a vision expert by any means, I'm primarily a hardware specialist, but I've done enough vision in school to know that it's incredibly challenging to get it right across different lighting conditions, let alone outdoors and different weather. I mean, you know, it, I, I yeah. had difficulty, you know, in incandescent versus fluorescent lighting versus, you know, with a shadow cast. So yeah. that's, that's incredible. So I think we've been really lucky at RE Squared that we found a lot of great partners who are willing to let us come out, you know, on site or collaborate with someone where we can go on site 
and collect real data of the real thing that we're trying to detect and interact with. So we actually do have some data of um, modules in the desert at different times of day, high sunlight, cloudy conditions. On other projects, we've been able to go to other sites um, and collect data. We've also built a structure at RE squared that allows us to simulate different rain conditions. Oh, that's cool. So it's this um, like kind of PVC pipe pavilion that you can put over top of equipment and pump water through it at different rates. And then we have a basin at the bottom that tells you the rate per hour. Oh, that's so you awesome. Can simulate rain and collect data that way. So we're definitely trying to um, capture as much data as possible because testing is the way that you, you know, make sure your algorithm remains as accurate as possible and is touching all the cases you're signing up for. Yeah, for sure. No, I mean, I, I've been in situations where there's just like one edge case you didn't test for that sinks your battleship. Yeah. <laughs> so that's, I like that rain rig a lot. That's, that's kind of brilliant. Do you yeah, find it's there's, cool. yeah, I, I think so too. Um, do you find there's any differences with how rain behaves in real life versus that, or is it pretty dead on? Um, I mean, there are some differences, but this is um, a little better approximation than us just manually, not manually, automatically adjusting the image with some pre-processing, right? Like adding some artificial droplets or adding some blur. Yeah, that um, makes sense. You know, this gives us a little bit more of that like water and air and the occlusion that you get between the object you're looking for and the optical frame of the camera. That's awesome. Um, and we are able to control the drop droplet size where we can get like a misting rain or a large drop rain. Is that so, just based off flow? Yep. Oh, cool. Yeah, that, that's, that's really awesome. I would love to be able to use that equipment at some point, but if it happens, it happens. It yeah, it's not like super fun. sophisticated, but it's definitely worthwhile in the use cases that we're using it for. Well, I've done things like, I mean, I, I've tested for ingress protection in a shower and I, I call that, I think, ghetto IP65. And so yeah. I thought about writing an article about this at one point. Because, like, you know, ghetto yeah. IP67 know would be in like... a trash can with a brick on it for. Yep. Know, I've seen minutes. that before, too. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah, but that, that's awesome. So um, I guess. Can you, can you talk about some of the stuff you've done in between now and then and kind of what's what's gotten you ready and how those lessons have come up? Yeah, so we've done some other um, pick and place work, but I think some of the more interesting work is what we're doing in aviation right now. Oh, cool. So we're doing some work for automatic aircraft refueling and some work for um, aircraft servicing, so laboratory and water services, as well as inspection. So two projects I can talk about um, are defense related. Uh, one of them we just were able to release the video on was about um, we put one of our Sapien 6M manipulators on a Pratt & Miller TMTI with a custom end effector designed by AFRL. Um, what is the TMTI? Um, it's the Pratt & Miller ground vehicle. Oh, I think um, I did see that video. Yeah. yeah, and uh, we're able to autonomously drive up to a mock helicopter panel, and there's a fuel nozzle on the panel, and we're able to autonomously manipulate uh, the end of arm tool and the hose to attach, so align to the fuel nozzle, as well as do a torque-based rotation until there's the appropriate coupling, oh, cool. and then counter-rotation and retrieval. One of the challenging parts of this problem is there's both an overhang and an underhang, so you have to be doing um, collision avoidance in real time to make sure that you're both aligned with the fuel port but not hitting other things. Yeah. Um, and that translates really well to other tasks, you know, like- Much easier said than done, by the way. Like for yeah. somebody that isn't a roboticist listening to this, turning a doorknob is a lot more difficult than going down the street when it comes to robotics totally. problems. <laughs> um, it's awesome. Yeah, and we also have another program that's spinning up right now which is um, aircraft inspection. So inspecting the surfaces with a manipulator that's on um, a vehicle that can move our manipulators to height. And then uh, so in this case, someone is teleoperating the manipulators in some cases, cool. but it, uh, can put it into an autonomous mode for other cases. Um, so finding defects, touching screws and bolts to make sure they're secure, um, those types of tasks. When you say touching to make sure they're secure, you mean like applying a torque and seeing if it comes loose or? Yep. 
That's awesome. And then if, I guess if you can apply so much, then you're in a good, you're in a good condition that passes, you go to the next one. Yeah. And the good news about this pro project is that we do have the human in the loop. So we get to learn from the humans who are operating it first and then get, you know, readings from our system to help us learn, you know, build a model for what that torque looks like. That's awesome. Yeah, and I mean, I, I guess this is just me being naive to the problem, but I would think if you're just going around loosening screws a teeny bit all around, like that <laughs> might create a problem in the long run, but I'm sure there's like a counter torque or something that, that accounts yeah, for Yeah, I don't think that we're like loosening the screws. You're kind of like tapping things that you think look suspicious. Oh, I see. So you don't, case. you don't necessarily go and try to loosen every screw. You just do like, right, this right, one right. looks like it might, like a human would do. You'd be like, ah, oh, that's, yeah. that's funny. Yeah, we should tighten that down. <laughs> so. Yeah. And again, like you said, the human would say, oh, that looks funny, but it's hard to teach the the camera, the computer that, oh, that, why that looks funny, right? There's a weird shadow or it looks a little bit more raised, you know, there's a difference in depth. So those are the things we're trying to learn by keeping the human in the loop. That's interesting. So do you find you're kind of developing the set of rules then that you, you sort of go off of to, to look when there's a defect or is it more abstracted than that? Again, to the extent um, you're allowed to talk about it. Yeah, I was going to say, this is a newer program, so I don't think yeah. we're that far along, but that's that's pretty much the goal, right? Cool. We're, we're trying to uh, be able to speak the rules first and then kind of define it from there and turn that into machine understandable language, right? Yeah, well, that's awesome. I, I mean, I feel like so many people are quick to just hide behind the magic of AI, you know? <laughs> so, you know, there's no problem understanding and then you wonder if that person understands it yourself. But what I really like about talking to you is that you're like, no, this is how we do it. <laughs> you know? Yeah, I, I will say that forward. like one of the interesting things in perception right now, you know, computer vision and autonomy is deep learning is a really you know, has been really successful in a lot of areas. Um, I think everyone's pretty honest that we don't always understand exactly how it works and why. Why did it pick these features? That doesn't make sense to me, but it makes sense to the machine. And at RE Squared, we really sit down and say like, should we be using more classical computer vision, geometric style techniques for this problem? Or do we really need to go and collect all of the data and go after a deep learning, machine learning style approach? Or is there some compromise between the two? Is one part of this problem harder than we think it is or easier than we think it is? So we're always trying to make those trade-offs um, because it also impacts your compute power, right? Yeah, of so. course. I mean, uh, that, that stuff's expensive as hell to run, so. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome. I mean, yeah, that's uh, that's really cool. And I mean, I, I've always been kind of focused on the same thing, which is just practical solutions that actually make sense for the problem at hand, so. Yeah. Nice. And I will say within my group, everyone is really collaborative. Um, we sit and talk about everyone's problems and weigh all the pros and cons of each different method and try to really make sure that we're grounding one another because it's exciting to stay on the cutting edge, right? Like, oh, I want to go build that model and see how well it works and tweak the hyperparameters. But that's not always, you know, the path that's going to get us to success. Yeah. And if, I mean, if you've got a field of viable project or product, I should say that, that actually runs and, and does what it's supposed to do every time. And you don't always get that with, I don't want to say with the bleeding edge, but with maybe less proven out technologies. So yeah. Yeah. Uh, that makes sense to me. Yeah. And we're also trying to do more and more with like on system computing. So in some of our underwater work, we're trying to pull all of that, you know, on vehicle, on arm for our land work. Um, you mean as opposed to like pushing it to AWS? Um, so right now we actually don't use AWS. Uh, we do everything remote or not remote, sorry, like locally. Oh, cool. Uh, we okay. All of our own um, processing and all of our own storage. And this is largely due to the restrictions that are put onto us by defense. Um, our defense customers and some of our commercial customers. Yeah, we do some ITAR work with FormLogic as well. And I, I did it when I was at SpaceX also. So that's, uh, yeah, you gotta, gotta do it. But no, when I, when you said on, uh, on system, I was referring to, you mean like edge as opposed to like in a data center, um, maybe AWS oh, I mean was like right on board, like on the, the physical vehicle. So our okay, underwater okay, work is all tethered right now. Cool. And so there's like, um, you know, surface level computing, right? Not everything lives on the system. And on some of our, you know, ground, ground robotics, we're trying to keep that as compact as possible, right? You don't want to have to, 
send things across the network, use a lot of radio signals for remote computing. We're trying to keep everything yeah, local. It's all susceptible to jamming, bad weather, rain attenuates, wireless signal. There's yeah. a lot of things that could knock it out. Whereas if it's right there, it's a more robust system. Yep. And that's really what we're, you know, focusing on as we roadmap our future, right? That's something that's really important to us. That's awesome. Yeah. No, I feel like with a lot of products that are coming out these days and, you know, I won't name any more brands, but like, you know, everybody's like, oh, don't worry about it. Not getting connected. You always said the internet. Don't worry about that. You know, <laughs> I, I don't know about that. Like my internet's gone out three times already today. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So. No, that's, that's, that's really cool. And that's kind of um, my own preference as well. So when I, when I see that, it does get me excited. Do you, can I, can I ask, like, do you kind of use mainly NVIDIA products, Intel products, some combination of both proprietary custom stuff, uh, all of the above? Yeah, a little bit of all of the above. I would say my group is mostly focused with NVIDIA products just because there's good support for that. It's easy to, you know, look things up and find support where needed. Um, and that's also where a lot of our past experience has been in my group. So we we brought a lot of that information with us. Those um, uh, Jetson and Xavier lines are pretty awesome. Yeah. <laughs> and they're nice and compact and yeah. 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 That's awesome. Have you talked with the NVIDIA guys here in Pittsburgh at all? Uh, that's kind of a fun office. Um, I don't think I've talked to anyone in Pittsburgh. We have talked to a couple of folks out in California. Um, we had some like internal connections and chatted with them as we were building up our um, internal like processing and storage site about their solutions and, you know, how they're tackling those types of problems. So, but no, no one in Pittsburgh yet. That's awesome. It's a small office. I think it's under 10 people. Oh, I, wow. Uh, okay. I was invited to one of their happy hours because I, I have two friends in the <laughs> Well, now I have more friends because I, I met a bunch of people that happy hour, but um, I, they're, they're just, it's, it's really friendly. It's really close knit. I, I like that I made up more than 10% of the happy hour when I went there. Yeah. <laughs> it's kind of funny. Um, is it like in the city or is it? In I like think the they're in or... Bakery Square. So oh, okay. um, that's uh, for people listening. That's where Google, uh, it's kind of the hip place to have an office in Pittsburgh. Yeah. Maybe like four years ago, it was like really hip, and you know now it's, you know, it's a place to have an office in Pittsburgh. Yeah, when I uh, first moved back to Pittsburgh, I lived in like the brand new apartment building at Bakery Square. Oh, cool. What is that like yeah. there? I, I've seen that one. That's a Walnut Capital project, I think. Yeah, um, it was cool. We, it was a little bit pricey for what it was. That uh, makes sense. So my husband worked at Google, works at Google, um, so he could just like walk across the street, right? And it was super convenient for that. We had a single <laughs> car. It's awesome. The apartment was nice, but um there are i don't know we moved to highland park to nice like, I love highland for park. a while and it was we could still ride our bikes everywhere and it was a lot cheaper that's awesome <laughs> but the apartments were beautiful so. yeah no my my apartment is is very cheap i, I live in squirrel hill I, I pay barely any money it's great and uh, <laughs> i'm gonna keep that as long as i can yeah yeah so there are some good gems like that in pittsburgh and i think we were really lucky to be where we were in highland park um, it was a cool little spot for a while. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, I, I like that bakery square area as well. I, I just don't know, like, it would make sense to live like the same with the strip district. Like, I like I like that area a lot. I don't know, I'd want to live there. Um, Form Logic is spinning up an office in Lawrenceville right now. That I, I okay, it's a so, great area. Same place as Ari squared. Yeah, exactly. We're neighbors. <laughs> yeah, I uh, I love it. Um, our, our current office, or I should say where we're doing the majority of our operations is in Robinson. So oh, uh, the downside is Lawrenceville is way more distracting in terms of lunch options. <laughs> <laughs> Rarely want yeah. to eat away from my desk in Robinson, but in Lawrenceville, I always want to eat away from my desk because there's so much good stuff going on there. Yeah, so. I think uh, Jurgen and I both have um, a distraction in bond me and tea. We love bubble nice. tea. That's awesome. <laughs> What, what places do you recommend in the area? Yeah, I do really love Bon Me and Tea. Oh, I didn't um, that was the name of the joint. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, La Gourmandine, the little French bakery there. That's Oh, I love that place. I actually spent two weeks in France and I was like, oh my God, they have one here too. This is amazing. Yeah. And then I also like B52. It's a vegan cafe, but they make excellent avocado toast. Oh, that's awesome. I'll have to check yeah. that out. So, and a really good, they make great coffee drinks. Um, 
and they do like to go ordering. And then when you come in, they make your drink fresh and it's ready to go. It's perfect. That's awesome. So that, that's my winter favorite. It's really close B52. to the office and an awesome warm drink. <laughs> nice. No, you're, you're great. I appreciate you catching me up to speed on this stuff. Yeah. Yeah. So far, I've kind of been, been feeling it out. I've started to like the Forge. I've always been a fan of the Abbey. Oh, I um, do like the Abbey. Yeah, the Abbey is, yeah, I mean, really it's good like, at, like uh, an edamame dip. They get like an that. edamame dip at the Abbey now? Yeah. That must be new. I got to check that out. <laughs> <laughs> I always just love that, like, in Pittsburgh, you could find a coffee shop slash pub. Like, that always struck me oh, as a totally, Euro thing. Yeah. I was like, this is sweet. <laughs> <laughs> and then the food's and super good. COVID, they had really good New Year's parties. We did a New Year's yeah. at the Abbey once, and it was fantastic. So. Oh, that's awesome. Also a nightclub. <laughs> nice. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, no, it's a, it's a fun spot. I feel like they definitely downscoped due to COVID, I mean, which I guess is, is responsible. Yeah. So now they're mainly well, they in that room next They built door. a new expansion or remodeled part of it. I don't know. Abby's yeah. always a nice spot. Yeah, Abby's great. Um, have you been to that place that's, I can't remember the name of it for the life of me, but it's uh, Asian Soul Food, I think is the concept. Oh, I know what you're talking about. I have not been there yet. But it's other super good. Um, not healthy, but the best fried chicken I think I've had in my life was there. Okay. <laughs> yeah, All right. hi highly recommend. So, I'll have to awesome. check that out. And then I think the first time I, I hung out with Jorgen was at Piccolo Forno uh, down the street. Okay. So. Also good. That's a little farther down. It's the other yeah, side it's... of the 40 Street Bridge, but... I think I'm such a hipster that like I'm like, ah, too many people go to Piccolo Forno. <laughs> 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 But I am becoming a regular at umami, so that's that's been fun. Umami's good. I've been there. Yeah, I, I've. It might be a problem. I've been there probably four or five times in the last month. So, uh, <laughs> that might be a little bit. Sounds like a regular. You're right. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's fun. So um, I guess uh, just to rein it back in. Uh, <laughs> Any any other work stuff that you're like particularly proud of that you you want to talk about or you're excited about? Yeah, I think just in general, it's been I, I've been at Ari Squared for three years, and it's been really awesome to see how you know we've been able to grow from teleoperated robotics to semi autonomous and autonomous robotic systems. Um, you know, Ari Squared was previously like a hundred percent defense funded. And now we are 60% commercial funded. You know, we're really grabbing onto the commercial work That's awesome. and committing to it. And we're seeing ourselves be successful and we're seeing our projects grow in all of the commercial areas that we've tried to tackle. So, you know, one of my, my big projects, you know, as a whole was building out what the autonomy stack looked like and uh, looking at different perception uh, capabilities, cameras, processing, you know, how we build out our machine learning pipeline, how we store all our data, how we set up plans for collecting data, working with existing AI infrastructure for our state machine, and then really building out like what our manipulator planner, where all the autonomous trajectory planning stuff happens, right? And how that connects to hardware. Um, I don't have a very strong hardware background, but I'm getting there. I'm learning a lot every single day with mechanical and electrical engineers, but building out that whole stack and seeing that, you know, span across multiple projects and grow and harden, you know, is really building out the capabilities for iSquared to be successful in autonomous robotics. That's awesome. And when you said that, I mean, I just realized, you know, I, I know a strong software background, but you get thrown in the deep end a few times. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I, I do have a computer science degree, but I resolved not to use it after I graduated. So <laughs> I, um, yeah, I've, I've been mainly a hardware hardware nerd but um there's been a few projects where like i remember there was one where i had to learn github to make it work and one of the software engineers the lead guy was like oh my god you're using github i'm like yeah well i gotta review your code somehow yeah so, I, school of hard knocks is a hell of a teacher but um yeah i think one of my favorite hardware stories is like i had a bag it had like cable parts in it and like pinout parts and someone goes you need to make a cable and i was like this is a cable. You know? <laughs> <laughs> I didn't under like I I was gonna go find someone to figure it out for me, but like I couldn't comprehend what they were saying because the bag you handed me had a cable in it, and you're saying go make the cable. So so it was just I a different type of cable, or um, it was like a power cable, right? Like it had a custom pin out to connect to some other system, and 
I just had a bag of stuff and one of the pieces in there looked like a piece of wire that was a cable. So you identified the right part? Sorry, I'm a little... <laughs> oh, like they needed to like build, they needed to like put all this stuff together, right? They needed to build the plug and connect it to the wire and do all of that. Oh, but... and you gave them the raw cable and you were like, got it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> I, like I just held up the bag. I was like, that is the cable. Very good. Done. <laughs> That's awesome. I mean, ultimately, I went and found the electrical engineer on the project, and we and he was like, "Oh, I understand what they need now." But yeah, yeah. I mean, we've all been there I, a few times. I've been uh, foot in mouth all the way. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I knew I was saying something silly, but it just seems so obvious to me. <laughs> yeah, for sure. No, I feel you. Yeah, I feel like like there's one thing I've gotten good at, which you know, almost maybe as a fault, which is just taking a conservative line to the point where like, I believe this to be the case, but I'm not sure, you know, to my knowledge, I think this is a cable. Uh, and yeah. you know, these days, I mean, I, I kind of get some crap for that. So like, dude, is it or isn't it? <laughs> tell, tell me what's going on here. Yeah. But I guess just from, from getting slapped so many times, I've just developed, you know, a very, you know, like, well, to my knowledge, it's this, do you concur? <laughs> <laughs> Talk like a consultant, yeah. I guess, but yeah. <laughs> that's awesome. Cool. Well, uh, yeah, it seems like we're hitting like a good uh, kind of conversational plateau here. So maybe maybe a good time to start to uh, taper off. Is there anything you want to plug or, or talk about, uh, you know, kind of toward the end of it? Sure. So RE Squared is hiring in general. You got to plug that. I will say RE Squared wants you. Hiring. <laughs> in my group. So I'm looking for, you know, people who have experience in computer vision and manipulator planning. Uh, we have, you know, a wide range of people in my group from mid-level to senior engineers. It's super collaborative and we're just looking for people who want to collaborate with us. Um, awesome. So definitely want to plug that. So mainly vision folks, RE Squared wants you. Uh, reach out to podcastsk.solutions or Oh, um, yeah, um, Amanda Scroy. I'm on LinkedIn, or it's just Amanda.Scroy, S G R O I, at re squared.com. Sweet. You're going to get a ton of spam. No, I'm just kidding. Oh, we don't have I the viewership so. for that. <laughs> <laughs> right, because well. if you get a bunch of spam, there's always one gem, right? So. Yeah, for sure. And I'm really bad with the resumes. I've probably got a thousand on red right now. <laughs> I can see if there's any vision people in there if you want. Yeah um yeah we're always looking um and we're working on really cool stuff so if you want to work I'll on that. And hard problems come our way awesome well hey thanks for coming on this is really really fun if you stuck around this long and you like what you've heard please give us a like and smash that subscribe button or smash that like button and give us a subscribe we're always looking for new and interesting people to have on the show if you know anyone good, send an email to podcast at ska.solutions or leave a comment below. Thanks again for listening and please come to the next one.